Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad you're here in the house of the Lord. So glad that you're here with us online, wherever you may be this morning. You're in the house of the Lord too. The Holy Spirit binds us all together. So we're here to celebrate uh, this great cornerstone we have in Christ Jesus. That's kind of a, a, a metaphor we're going to use as we look at the scriptures later and talk about Jesus becoming the very core of our life. But right now, we want to lift our voices in praise. So if you would stand, let's sing this song that celebrates how praise draws us toward God. Praise lifts us into his very presence. Let's lift him up. Says the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. to sing a song now that reminds us that the holy water, holy water is, is really, it's the breath of the Spirit. Holy water is what Jesus brings to us just when we need him most. We think about that water of baptism that cleanses us and renews us and gives us resources for life. And every time we allow him to be the core, every time we allow him to live through us, then we feel the touch of that holy water in our lives. Let's, let's celebrate that now. Oh 
only thing that ever really makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace and God I need it every day it's the only continues to wash us and make us clean and make us whole. Pour out your spirit on us, O oh God, so that we feel your holy water cleansing us even in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Hey, Concord. I'm Haley Ragsdale. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we're glad you've joined us for worship. If this is your first time connecting with us, please text WELCOME to 865-302-3616. We'd love the chance to get to know you. Join us next Sunday, May 22nd at 3 p.m. for our Spring Handbell Concert presented by the Concord Bell Choir in the Sanctuary. Not able to make it in person? No problem. The concert will be live streamed as well. You can find all our live streamed events on our website or on the Concord United YouTube channel. We hope you will plan to sign up and serve with our summer mission trip to Plymouth, North Carolina, June 11th to the 16th. Each person serving will help improve the living conditions for families that are struggling. Projects will include window replacement, bathroom and kitchen rehab, providing a new roof, drywall installation, painting and deck building, and there may be a new house build thrown into the mix. Adults, young adults, and students are all invited to participate. Contact Jane Curran for more information. Our thrift store has been a huge success so far. We'd love for you to volunteer at the thrift store. For more information, visit concordunited.org slash thrift store. Check out this video to learn more about the thrift store. We're here at the thrift store, a mission of Concord United Methodist Church. It's our grand opening, and we are just so excited. There's lots of people here today. The ice cream truck is here. We're making popcorn and selling lots of things that people need. We're really excited about the opportunity to make items affordable for families who really need them, and yet give others a way to share what they have extra and make it a thrifter's paradise. Hey, this is Knox County Mayor Glenn Jacobs. I'm super excited to be here at the Concord United Methodist Thrift Store. Really excited to be here at the grand opening. This place is gonna provide a great service for a lot of folks in our community, something that is really needed. Really thrilled to be here and very appreciative of the folks who are making this possible. Believe it or not, it's been a short 10 months since we had our first meeting about the thrift store. And we've spent a lot of time putting our business plan together, getting all the approvals, but here we are. We're open, come see us. Welcome, we are so glad that you are here and the thrift store is an amazing ministry. I was just thinking as she was talking, 10 months since this 
started real, had been a seed that had been planted, but an amazing thing. Want to be sure you know about the team that is leading the store. We have Lacey Fitzgerald as our manager. We have Megan McNeil as our assistant manager, and Daniel Neal is our um, receiving manager, and they're doing an incredible job along with all of you all who are volunteering and serving through the thrift store. We thank you so much for that. Um, if it is your first time with us, we encourage you to text WELCOME to 865-302-3616. This is a way for us to get to know you and you to get to know us. No obligation. You don't have to. You don't have to reply. It's like one of those texts you get. I don't know. Do y'all do that? You don't respond to every text? Or am I the only one that does that? Laughter is a sign of understanding. Be sure to complete your connection card that you received when you came in and include your prayer request. We appreciate the opportunity to come together as a community of faith to pray. Um, and we, we really appreciate that. If you're here in the building, um, be sure also if it's your first time to stop by the information desk for a gift. We are taking up a offering um, for what is called um, the special um, project with annual conference. We do this every year, and this year it is food buckets to Zimbabwe that will go to kids who are under underprivileged and they will receive these food buckets. Um, the food buckets are $50 um, for to contribute. $50 is one food bucket. If you contribute 25, it's half and someone else contributes to 25. Our goal as a congregation is 50 food buckets. And just like how we give our tithes, there are multiple ways that you have the option to contribute. You can do so online via text by mail or there are boxes on the side of the wall as you exit the door and those are ways that we can contribute this is an incredible generous community of faith and we thank you for continuing to be such today is an important day in the life of our church 21 sixth graders are at 6 o'clock p.m. tonight will profess their faith in Jesus Christ. It is a really big deal. I still remember my confirmation. It's been a couple of years ago, a couple of decades ago, if we're being truthful about that. But I still remember it. It was, it was a really big deal because that's when I said publicly that I, I do believe in Jesus and I do believe he's at work in my life. And so 21 students um, remembering that it is never just about the student, it is about a community, a family and friends that are walking with students. So that, that service is live streamed tonight at six o'clock. So you are welcome to join us. And next week in all of our services, we are doing what we are calling re recommitment Sunday. Our read through the Bible plan, like, can you believe we're almost done with that? Nobody, crickets. It's like, what are you talking about? Um, like, y'all have not been doing it? Yes, I know you have. But anyways, that actually concludes, that reading plan concludes in a couple of weeks. And part of the coming to the end of that process is in conjunction with our sermon is recommitting, which is what our um, students are doing. They are committing today. I also want to let you know, in case you're concerned, the reading plan ends in a couple of weeks, but the summer Bible plan starts right then as well. So what we're doing is reading the Bible is not something we just do for nine months. It's a part of who we are. And so we will have a new plan going live in the next couple of days. Be sure to watch out for that. But let us come together as a community faith in prayer. Oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, we thank you. We thank you that we get to show up how we are. We may be smiling on the outside, but on the inside, we may be struggling. And we get to show up that way, wherever we are. And you meet us in that. You walk with us. You journey with us. And we claim that truth today. 
We thank you for the gift of the 21 students who will profess their faith this afternoon, for the family and friends who have walked and will continue to walk with them and with each of us. And Lord, we just ask you to move in us as we consider how we need to recommit to following you each day, every day, on the days we feel it and the days we don't, because that's what we profess, that we wanna be about you in all ways of our lives. Lord, just convict us in that. Lord, we, we pray for those um, who serve at our thrift store. We pray for those who come to the thrift store. May they know you, get to know you through us. May they leave there with grace and love having been shown. And we thank you for those who lead in this ministry. Lord, we pray for those who are without, without shelter, without home, home without food, without water, and without hope. May we, in all those situations, may we feel you that you are with us and where you are leading us to help provide, may we follow. When we leave here, may we have the assurance that we have been with you and that you go with us each step of the way into your hands, may your will, not our will be done, amen. sight to the blind. I believe that the dead come to life. I believe there were wonders and signs. You're still the same. I believe every word you say. I believe there are scars in your hands. That your goodness is good without end. Will never change. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age. All I know there is power, the power to save. Oh, I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Always. Your mercy is mine. Age after age, all generations will bow down and praise the Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. You are, you are, you always will be God. You are, you are, you always will be God. You always will be God. I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name.
age after age, all generations will bow down and praise the Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Hi, Grandma. I thought you might want to see this. I've never been so excited or scared. A little life completely dependent on me. How will I know what to do? Oh, child, I felt the same way once. Now listen, you'll be a great mom. It's harder than you think, but being a mom is better than you could ever imagine. When you have a child, you begin to love like you've never loved before, which makes it a lot easier to do what you've never done before. Will's not in here, is he? Do you see him anywhere? If you don't know Will, Will's our senior pastor designate. Um, I don't talk about running when Will's in here. Because when, when I run three miles, Will still has 23 to go. <laughs> so, but I've, I've been running off and on for a long time. And um, in, in my own way, in my own distances. And, and I noticed as I got older, I was starting to get some pain in my hamstring. And, and I understand now it's this sci sciatic nerve. And, and some of you may relate to this. It kind of starts at, you know, at your waist and goes all the way down to your knee. And it really gets you when you're driving after about an hour and a half and you just have to, you know, change positions or get out of the car for a while. But I went to this sports therapist to try to figure out what was going on. And, and she had me do some exercise exercises and she had me run down the hallway and back and looked at some stuff and she said well uh, your core is a mess <laughs> excuse me I do crunches she said yes crunches that's one minor core exercise that just gives you a six pack and I'm like I have more like a family variety pack I didn't know it was going to give me a six-pack, but she said, yeah, that, that's what that does. But, but your core, you need to do other exercises because you've got all these muscles that you can't see that no one knows, but you know. And, and there are all sorts of bridges. If you know what a bridge is, that's a really good core exercise. Planks are a really good core exercise. And boy, that's a sleeper. Don't anybody tell you that those are easy to do. Try it sometime. Get on your toes and your forearms and hold that for as long as you can. And you tell me if you make it for a minute the first time. Time. But all these core exercises strengthen these muscles that you can't see, and they support everything you do. And she told me, and this makes sense, as you get older, you really need to work on that because what a strong core does is help you to be able to stand up straight, to catch yourself if you start to fall. You know, your, your, it's your inner ear and your brain that keep you standing up because we're really top heavy and we shouldn't be able to stand up at all. But all these muscles are constantly twitching and moving so that we can stand up straight. That's those core muscles that do that. And they support everything that we do. And you'll be healthier, you'll be stronger, uh, you'll be more stable. We all will be, but particularly as we get older, if we we do things to strengthen our core. The core, our core is the foundation of our strength. And regardless of, of what our, you know, our other muscles may look like and bodybuilders, you know, can have all this incredible physique and all that, but that's not nearly as important to health as having a strong core that nobody will ever see, but you know it just because uh, of the way it supports everything that you do. So you can kind of do that in a highlighter uh, in your mind for a minute that our core is the foundation of our strength because we're going to come back to that. In fact, I want to talk about a different core. I want to talk about uh, having the core of our very being, our spiritual self, if you will, which is really at the core of everything that we do. And there's a passage from a letter called First Peter. Peter, one of the apostles, wrote some letters. Uh, there were several uh, apostles who wrote letters that are at the end of the New Testament, uh, and we're kind of working through, through those in our current sermon series. Paul wrote a lot of them, First and Second Corinthians and Romans and Ephesians. Uh, but there also uh, are, uh, there's First and Second Peter, there's First and Second Timothy, which is actually a, a letter Paul wrote. We're gonna, I'm going to read from First Peter as he was speaking to the church, uh, trying to encourage them to not let go uh, as they heard all these new things, as, as, as Christianity, what called that then, but as the movement began to grow, 
They were hearing things that may be different, and he wanted to remind them of what the foundation of their faith is. So let me read this to you from 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. I love that little nod to the Psalms. There's a Psalm that says, see and taste that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by people but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this letter and all the letters and every word in your written word that reveals to us always and every time your living word who is Jesus the Christ. We pray now that the same spirit that, um, that prompted and inspired Peter to write would prompt and inspire us to hear, that we find truth today about this core, this foundation in our life who is Jesus the Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Um, cornerstone is an architectural term, I guess, and it's been around for ages and ages. My daughter, older daughter, is an architect, and I've talked to her about it. And, you know, cornerstones is, are not as much a part of modern-day building, particularly homes as they used to be, still part of big buildings. But, uh, but, but no, not that many years ago, they, they would lay this initial stone in the foundation. And the cornerstone had to be just right. Whatever direction that building was supposed to face, um, that cornerstone had to be perfect because with this one stone, all the other stones, everything else in the structure, all of the framework, all of the metal, if metal is involved, all the brick, all the mortar, everything is in relationship to that one cornerstone. If it's off, everything will be off. If it's right, then everything will be right. And, and so Peter uses that, and the Bible uses it in other places as is referenced in his passage about Jesus being the cornerstone. He's the one. He's the one that, that the whole world, the whole universe is in relationship with, and we are to be rightly related to him as well if this structure, if our structure, our being, our person is going to be is going to be sound and solid with a, with a good foundation. And when Peter talks about the cornerstone and building a temple, he's referring to the temple in Jerusalem that was built twice. They built it, it was torn down. They built it again, it was torn down again. And so now Peter's using that sort of as a metaphor for not only the church, but for us as individuals, that God is building this, this, this temple out of living stones. That's you and me. And the, that we need to have this cornerstone, this one that will then be uh, who our whole life is in relationship with if we want our life to be straightforward. So, and, and, and structurally sound. So what I want to do is talk about our core this morning for just a few minutes. And I want to talk about Jesus as being the core of everything. And I want to start with the macro, and then we're going to work our way all the way down to the micro. Uh, and I think you'll see that there's great power in understanding that Jesus is the core of everything and that means that he is fully capable of being the core of our lives because, for instance, let's start with this. Jesus is the very core of the universe. And let me read, let me read a passage to you. Uh, this is from Colossians, and that's just a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. If he were to write this church a letter, it would be called Concordians, I guess. But this is Colossians, and in it, in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he says this. He's speaking of Jesus. 
For in him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And that to me is the most powerful part of that whole passage. Not only was Jesus there at the beginning we learned that in John's gospel where it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God that's John's introduction to who Jesus was we have to understand Jesus was a man who lived for 30 some odd years as the flesh and blood incarnation of God Jesus was was God you know we think of God as father son holy spirit uh, just as a way of helping us understand how God relates to his creation and to us and Jesus is that second person that that son if you will and so so Jesus wasn't just around for 30 years he was in flesh and blood but he was around in the beginning he made everything he called everything into creation and not only did he call it into creation, everything now, everything. And when the Bible says everything, there's no limitation to that. It's not just, well, what stars we can see in the moon and the sun. It's like everything visible and invisible. And we know that most of, our, most of this universe is invisible. We have theories in physics uh, that help us understand something about what's beyond what we can actually probe and, and, and observe. But all of that, everything, was created by him and he holds it all together. And when we think about how big that must be and we think about what's going on in our lives, we're gonna to get to that in a minute, that if he can hold all that together, maybe there's a chance that he can hold us together as well. And to get some idea of, of this massive cosmic son of God, second person of the Trinity, Christ, Think about this. Did you read about the, 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 uh, the, the discovery they made? Well, actually, they knew it was there. It's called Sagittarius 4. It's a new, it's a new black hole. Well, it's not a new black hole. It's new to us, we, or at least to our knowledge. It's, they've discovered now that there's this black hole that's the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It's our galaxy. Lots of galaxies out there. And they now, did you see they have a picture of it? And I can't believe I didn't think to bring one to put up on the screens. But you can just Google it when you, if you want to. I think it's fascinating. They have this picture now of this black hole that they have theorized for a long time. They've, thought, they've known about this thing for years. But now they actually have a picture of it. And, and a black hole, and, and I'm not a scientist, heaven knows, but it, it's my understanding that it's this, it's this spot in the, in the universe where, where the gravity is so strong uh, that it can actually warp time, and it draws things to it. And what you actually see is the energy of this black hole consuming. You know what it, it, things in, in space, you know what it consumes? For instance, it consumes stars that have burned out and they implode on themselves and when they do this black hole sort of eats them and then it just feeds the black hole and the black hole then becomes this center uh, uh if you will of of our galaxy and is a part of why the galaxy is what it is and a part of uh, the greater part of why space continues to expand and 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 we when we learn about these things it helps all aspects of life, things that we learn about space, we can apply to other parts of our life. And what I love about that is, is that Jesus is up there. And I think, I think whenever we get a picture of a black hole, Jesus is like, oh, they got my good side. That was good. You know, you know, we're up there going, how did this happen? How, how, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus is like, well, I just poke my finger and black hole. There we go. And I think, well, put one over here, put a galaxy over there. Now that may seem silly, but think about this. How big is that black hole? It's a super, that, what's it, it's called like a super mass, super massive, which sounds like a silly term, but that's actually what they call it. To give you some idea, that black hole is bigger than four million of our suns. And I think the sun's pretty big. So this thing is huge. And yet that's just one feature of this invisible universe that's becoming more visible day by day. And Jesus made that. And he holds all of that together. And he created this sort of this universe that recycles itself and stars burn out and it sucks them down the black hole and the black hole is whatever it does with it. And, and we don't have, you know, all these old dead stars out there floating around. That's pretty cool. But, 
But see, here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus is the creator and core of everything that exists and holds it together with glory and power. The psalm says, you know, that, that we see God's glory in the stars and what we can see, the visible. And we see the glory of God in his magnificent creation. But when we think about what's beyond all that, then the glory is just amplified. And Jesus holds it all together with glory and power. Now, hold that thought. Now, let's move from macro a little closer in uh, and talk about this. Jesus is not only the core of the universe. Jesus is the core of the church. Um, Peter talked about how we are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, comparing the church that was being formed around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to this temple where they used to worship, where they did animal sacrifices, and now we offer our lives as living sacrifices. But Jesus is, well, let's put it this way. The church is not about Jesus. The church is Jesus. There'd be no church without Jesus. It's all his idea. It's all formed around him. It's all about him bringing a glimpse of this coming kingdom that we'll all one day participate in, either through our death or through whatever happened, whatever time it is when God decides game over and, and, and we're all raptured up and however that's going to work, and I don't know much about that. But I do know that there's this perfect kingdom. And what we have on earth is, is a little glimpse of that. That's what Jesus came to show us. Essentially, a little bit of heaven on earth. And the church is supposed to be ground zero for that. But what happens in the church is sometimes we forget that Jesus is, not, is the core of the church. Jesus is not just an idea. He's not just a picture hanging in the back of the sanctuary. He's not just a song that we sing on Sunday morning. He's not just a class that we teach. It, it, Jesus is what it's all about. And when we forget that, the church develops all sorts of of black holes and there can be all sorts of division and and heaven knows we all have different ideas about things but there's one idea we all have in common and we divide over these other issues and we forget this one huge thing we have in common and that's the core the foundation of the church and remember the core is our is the foundation of our strength we forget that it's Jesus. I went to seminary from 96 to 99 at uh, Emory University in Atlanta, Candler School of Theology. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty, theologically speaking, pretty progressive place. I went there, you know, it was just kind of like most of us. I'm somewhere in that middle area, you know, trying to figure out what, what I believe and what I don't believe. And actually, my beliefs were pretty well formed when I got there. I went there to get a theological education to maybe learn something about what it means to be a pastor of a church. When I got there, I realized that, man, there were ideas were everywhere. You had the faculty, uh, and, and these people were uber smart, and they certainly tended to believe the same way, maybe a little more on the progressive side. But you had people from, there were 41 different, 41 different denominations. I didn't know there were that many represented when I was there at Candler School of Theology. So you had all these different beliefs. And sometimes there were very heated debates in classes from people who take a more traditionalist approach and people who take a more progressive approach and all of us people sort of in the middle there. And sometimes we got distracted and sometimes um, it got really heated and we didn't act much like people who wanted to be part of a church. So that was, that was pretty common. So my favorite week of the year when I was in seminary was Black Studies Week because they would bring in a great black preacher. And I'm using that word very, instead of African-American, I'm using that word very specifically because that's, that's what they used. It was that great black tradition in, of, of church and preaching. And let me tell you, the greatest preaching in the world is the best black preaching because, because these men and women bring this, this great theological knowledge uh, and, and great um, and great intellect to the pulpit, but then but they also bring this absolute openness to the power of the Holy Spirit to do what the Spirit's going to do. And when you get that together, it's just well, you you just see glimpses of heaven in those sermons. So on this particular week, they had uh, the Reverend Frank Reed, who is now a bishop. He was at that time the senior pastor of Bethel A.M.E. Church in Baltimore, which is one of the largest black churches in the country. He brought a small part of his choir and and an and a person to play the Hammond organ. And oh my word, 
um, he, he, like all the great black preachers do, he got up and he thanked the dean. He thanked everyone from the dean of the school all the way down to the students. And, and then he, start, he had a manuscript and he started preaching this sermon. And I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes into it. And our chapel services tended to be pretty vanilla. And I like vanilla ice cream okay, but, but the services could be pretty boring. Can I say that? It wasn't my cup of tea. Um, so, so he's preaching, and then all of a sudden the manuscript falls on the floor. And he stepped back and he said, I can feel my help coming. And then... All of a sudden, he just, in about five or six minutes, he took us from how Christ is seen in the Old Testament and walked him up through the birth and walked him up through his life and walked him through the death and resurrection. And all of a sudden, everyone in the room, tenured professors, students of all theological and political and social flavors, all of us were up on our feet, our tiptoes, shouting, Jesus. And he was jumping up and down and just turning in circles, shouting Jesus. And he had this way of getting us focused on what the core of the church really was. And, you know, we can talk about our differences and we can talk about what we agree and disagree on, but there's one thing that was unmistakable, and that is that Jesus is the focus. And when Jesus is lifted up, when Jesus becomes the point, when Jesus becomes the center of gravity, when Jesus becomes our energy, when Jesus becomes our focus, then everything changes and all of that stuff disappears and all you can see and all you can feel and all you can know to be true is that Jesus is Lord and it swept us up in it and I'll never forget it and that's what the church is all about it's 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 Jesus period and we go down all these black holes and and that's not to say that Beliefs don't matter. They do. And people disagree. And I understand that. And I respect whatever your belief is, whether it's like mine or different. I respect that. But at some point, we can't let it take us down a black hole and start dividing and, and, and diluting who we are as the people of God. We have to find a way to stay together and work together and keep lifting up Jesus and lifting up Jesus. And whenever, whenever we're preaching, a, when, anytime we start excluding people and anytime we start limiting, people, uh, limiting people's access to speak their minds and all that, anytime we start doing that, then, then we've drifted away. But when we focus on Jesus and unconditional love and mercy and grace and all that, then, then Jesus is back at the core of the church again. And Jesus is the core of the church. Jesus is the creator and core of his church, and he holds it together with grace and love, just like he holds the universe together with glory and power. Now, before we go, let's take it down one step closer We've gone from the macro, we've come down to the church, and now let's look at this. Jesus is the core of each believer. Two quick pieces of scripture um, from Luke. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's trying to help them understand this kingdom and what's at the center of the kingdom and what will be the new center of their life. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show them what he's like. He is like a person building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose and the stream broke against that house, it could not shake it because it had been well built because it was built on him and then this one from uh, from hebrews um this is the covenant i will make with them after that time says the lord i will put my laws in their hearts and i'll write them down on their minds in the temple days the law was on scrolls and it was written out and you had to learn you had to memorize it and i've used this image before it's kind of like dancing it was kind of like the old and you, many of you won't remember this but back in the day there was this arthur murray dance studios and they had these footprints on the floor and if you wanted to learn i don't know the the foxtrot or something you put this foot here put that foot there this foot here and that foot there and if you stepped in all those right places and suddenly you were dancing that's kind of the way the law was but now it's been written on our hearts so that now it's more like when you just are with someone you love and the music starts playing and you just close your eyes and you start moving and you just let the spirit 
of the moment and the music and the love move you around. That's, that's what happens whenever Jesus becomes the core of who we are. Um, we've, this church did a lot of, of uh, renewal uh, after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, it was incredible. We sent, I don't know, up to 30 teams, I think, uh, down there and, and uh, got involved in rehabilitating homes and all that. And of course, the first step in that whole process is that what they called mucking the house. And, and many of these houses that we went to, you know, had been up to the second floor in water. And so they, they had to be completely stripped down. They had to take all the sheetrock out, all the carpet up, ceilings out, everything. So it was just the framework of the house. And they would spray it down with this, um, this um, um, ammonia mixture uh, to... Um, to kill any mold that might be growing. And it was just down to this, this treated, uh, this, this, the studs and, and floor, floor joists and whatever that had been treated. And then you could go in and build. So we were down in D'Iberville, Mississippi, working on a house once, uh, and we were putting a roof on it and we were putting sheetrock up. And this woman had been living in her backyard in a camper for close to a year because she didn't have any money to fix her house and one of our church members went to Home Depot and bought all the supplies she needed that was necessary to sheetrock her house get it dried in with a new roof and so when we when we get we started doing the sheetrock we you know we started writing we wrote some scripture verses and some prayers on on those freshly cleaned uh, studs and all and then we you know put sheetrock up over that and we just we love the idea of, of of let let that be in the foundation of her house and I remember she came in after we had all the sheetrock up and she walked into the house and she was walking down the hallway with her hands out touching the walls and she started to cry and she said I have walls I have walls I have a home again and I told the kids later that night and we were having devotions, don't ever think that you can't change someone's life because you just changed that woman's life forever. And, and, and it was because all of those students and all the adults who were in our group, everybody put everything aside and just let Jesus flow through them. Jesus was the core of each of those believers, the students, the adults, and everybody, and, and came together. And now, literally, he was written. He was written on the studs, on the studs and the framework of her house, and now she's had this house that she could move into. And that's the way it is with us. He comes and cleanses us with that holy water we sang about. And he writes his love on our heart. And then it be he becomes the core of our life. And brothers and sisters, we've got to have him as our core because something will, something else will take over. And I, I couldn't, I woke up thinking about the last thing I read last night before I went to bed. And that was the news about that terrible shooting in Buffalo, New York, where this racist shot, went into a store, went to a supermarket and killed 10 people and wounded three others. That was the tally, I think, the last thing that I read. And he had written all these, he had these manifestos on social media about, about it, was, it was clearly, clearly racially motivated. And I thought, what's, what was at his core? And, and now I'm not saying anybody here is about to do anything like that. I'm not saying that. That's, that's, that's over the top. But it happened. It happened. There are 10 people who are dead because this person had, had a bad core and a bad foundation. And when, when Jesus is our foundation, then, then we won't have to worry about malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander as the letter starts off. All of that's gone because Jesus is at the core and he fills us up and there's no room for any of that. And whenever we feel like we're falling apart and we start to allow some of that stuff to come in, the same one who holds the universe together and tells the black holes where they are to be holds us together and knows about every black hole in our heart and he can control that and he can see us through those times brothers and sisters he is the core of the universe he is the core of the church and he needs to be your core and my core because the core is the foundation of our strength and our strength will be will be unsurpassable. Nothing can get past him. Nothing will be able to lead us down those black holes if Jesus is our core. 
That's what, that's what our confirmands have been learning. The ones who will be confirmed, some will be baptized. That's what they've been learning. They've been learning about Jesus so that he can become the core of their life. And no matter where they go and what they do and who they become, Jesus will be that core, that, that building block that gets them started in the right direction. And so that everything they build on top of it is in relation to that and will be strong and sound and holy and good and they can take their place in that royal priesthood that God has invited us into. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, that you would, you would have us to be royal priests. That's uh, mind-boggling for us, oh God, that you would consider us precious stones in this house you're building out of these people who simply have chosen Jesus to be their core. Oh, Lord, thank you. I pray for these students who will be con confirmed and baptized tonight that they never forget this core, that, it, that they have allowed the church and your Holy Spirit to build in them this core who is Jesus. I pray for our church that we never forget that as we talk about our differences, and we, and we always have differences, that we remember that we have this core who is Jesus and let him be the gravitational pull that holds us together just as he holds the whole universe together. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing a benediction together. Yesterday